over today. Thank you. Seamlessly. So the first collision I want to talk about is that of people, platforms, content, and experiences. And it's about taking a moment to think um, about what's happening in the way that we access, create, consume content. And it's been quite easy recently to overcomplicate things. Um, when we think about content, we can get confused and bogged down. And, and the reality is our audiences don't think about the silos we create of channels, of media formats, of you know, where we're going to publish this, what kind of content is it. At this most basic level, I think, is simplest just to think you've got people, audiences, and then stuff people want to do on the other side. So the stuff people want to do or the stuff we want to access might be you know, a video of a dancing cat feeding tips for their babies. It might be custom ser customer service or something just to waste their time on. Or, you know, maybe they, like 38 million other people, are trying to work out what color the dress is. Quick show of hands, how many blue and blacks have we got? Um, white and golds? It's incredible, isn't it? So that's half the audience. So <laughs> and that's why, you know, that piece of content <laughs> causes discussion <laughs> and conversation <laughs> that can't be stopped. And that's kind of what's really important about it. Some people call this the viral singularity. It's this piece of content was shared more times than any other piece of content ever in the history of the world. Um, you know, BuzzFeed uh, were really smart in the way that they backed it. And we'll talk a little bit more about them about later. But the point I want to make with it is just if you can get the technology out of the way or get the mix right, then the natural behaviors of people will win out and the content will spread. And it's kind of worth thinking about what does content mean? What are the big brands and how does that work at the moment? So there are kind of two schools of thought of that at the moment. You've got the old world, uh, and some people are saying, right, this is the death of quality journalism. It's the death of quality content and print. Paywalls aren't working. What are we going to do? The end is nigh. And then you've kind of got this other world that's saying, well, maybe this is the golden age of journalism. Maybe the sort of visceral news reporting you're getting from the likes of Vice, the fact that BuzzFeed hire a political editor, the fact that Vox are creating new short form stories and news, the fact that Medium keep reinventing themselves. Um, perhaps that's actually the, the new golden age. And I think, as, as brands, there's something we can learn from that. And I'm not saying that you, know, you need to go out and be a publisher and all, you know, you spend all your time creating branded content, because we know that's hard and that's a difficult route to take. But actually, on a smaller level, if we track some of these kinds of brands, some of these publishers, and say, well, what can we learn about driving engagement and participant, about the way they operate? And that's what I want to have a little look at. So there's one thing to think about. <laughs> <laughs> the relentless rise of the creator class, you know, the top 100 YouTube channels at the moment, there are no brands in there at the moment. The Maker Studios, who own PewDiePie, 36 million subscribers, why? Um, these massive numbers, it's just incredible. Like, they are commanding such large amounts of sums now. And the thing is, if you start to work with one of these, these high-end creators, you have to hand over complete editorial control. And that's a really tough call for a brand to make. So the reality is, though, with this, with all these publishers, with all these creators, there's a long tail, and there's lots more people. In reality, I think that long tail goes right down to every single one of us. If you've got a social media account, you're in the entertainment business. And that's kind of one of the apps that we saw really, really take off uh, at, um, at South By. So this is Meerkat. Um, and it's kind of Meerkat is a live streaming app, and it arrived at a real perfect storm moment, I think. It was the ideal event to give it a bit of traction. You know, FOMO, fear of missing out, was so pervasive at South by. 1,100 sessions, you know, you sit down in five minutes. Am I in the right session? Is this shit, is it going to be good? Was the clickbait, did it just drag me in here? What's everyone else doing? Check on Twitter. Oh, look, there's a live stream. Uh, all my friends, you know, people are at home. They want to be here. They're trying to check it out um, uh, on Meerkat. The thing is, it's not just about the technology. Live streaming's been around for ages. You know, do you remember Ustream? It's like 10 years ago, you could live stream from your phone. Okay, maybe the bandwidth wasn't there. Um, but actually, it's just the way they integrated, the way it became effortless, the way it was instant to publish. You could create disposable live streams of content straight away in Twitter. Of course, then Twitter, a couple of days later, launched their own. Periscope comes out. Uh, they immediately re uh, remove all Meerkat's access to Twitter, so therefore you can't follow make followers. Um, but that's classic of the kind of tech battles. It's a David and Goliath thing. Who will be victorious? We'll have to wait and see. If you're wondering which one to try, I would probably go with Periscope. Actually, the feature set's a little bit better. Um, but ultimately, it's something you've got to work out, you know. 
do you need a live stream strategy? Should you start to play with it? Probably yes, probably worth having a little bit of a go. You know, um, Some of the things that are worth trying perhaps, um, if you're wondering what kinds of content, you could do maybe a sneak peek or something. Are you doing a new product? Are you doing a special event? Can you bring people in behind the scenes? Um, can you get an audience kind of over your line just to start to participate? Um, or try something like a, an Ask Me Anything session, you know, the kind of thing that, um, uh, that, that got famous on, on Reddit. And one of the things we've started to try, actually, we might have our uh, live Periscope stream here. Where's the remote gone? Sorry, it's not nabbed me yet, button. But it might, I just thought it might be useful just to have a quick look at uh, what it looks like. Maybe briefly. OK, it's gone off. Never mind. Have a look. If you go to our Twitter feed, though, you'll see um, probably a live, a live Periscope stream of us there. Another collision that we saw is um, this idea of apps becoming content, um, disposable pop culture kind of kind of content, but in the format of apps. So this is Bob's feed, cute or not? It's kind of Tinder for cats and dogs. <laughs> <laughs> And it's so easy to fall into the trap of thinking, well, oh, my app has got to provide tons of utility. I've got to spend ages on the UX. It's got to be really efficient. Um, but actually, if you can just throw something together, throw an idea together, um, and people will engage and have a play with it. There's nothing wrong with a throwaway, sort of frivolous app. People engage with 26 apps a month on average. Quite a few of those are ones they'll just have for that month, ones that get talked about and forgotten. You know, we've had a play with our own, the demo's over there. Um, you know, we're translating tummy rumbles into pizza orders for Domino's. Now, that's not our e-commerce strategy. It's just something to have a little bit of fun with. Something that when you're in the pub, you get it out, you talk to your mates. It's a bit of sticky content in that sense. So messaging apps. Again, people spend a long time in these messaging apps, the likes of WhatsApp, Snapchat. So they launched Discover shortly before, um, shortly before South By. There's a lot of conversation with all the content talks about what does that mean for content formats. You know, people, uh, the engagement rates are so high in Snapchat Discover um, that you could, they're, they're charging really high um, prices because, just because of those engagements. We heard rumors of $100 CPMs. I don't know if anyone's done a buy yet, but um, that's as far as I can tell. It's quite expensive uh, to get involved. But I think it's worth seeing where that where that pans out. Um, sports was another big thing. There's South by Sports, its own separate event, there's then the conversion around technology. Um, and the publishers there were looking at ways to expand um, the sports uh, event. So how do they get more value out of their, out of their sponsorship? So you saw great things like the Seattle Sounders sort of amplifying the march to the match and all the rituals around that, the revival of podcasting after Serial and, and many others. Um, and, and afterwards, you know, what's the content that comes out afterwards? So things like um, the NFL's Giferator here. So, you know, ways of getting people to capture, curate content and share it and socialize it can be really useful um, to help just extend that, that value that you can get. So with all of these kinds of collisions, new forms of content, you end up with a bit of a new, new sort of content playbook and you could easily spend an hour on this. But just one example to take away, I think. Um, Jonah Prateri, CEO of BuzzFeed, talked a little bit about their strategy. And they say things, you know, producing emotionally resonant content. So things like this, weird lies all couples tell each other. Um, if you watch that video, you kind of find little moments of you and your significant other in it. And of course, when you watch it, you go to Facebook and you post it and you tag your significant other in the Facebook post. And sort of instantly, because of the structure, because of the topic of that content, it's become more shareable. Um, and then you think about then where do you publish that? So they've also shifted their strategy a little bit from, you know, you normally you create a piece of content, you write a post, you pop it out on Facebook, uh, on Twitter and whatever, and it has a link and it drives you back to that site. So this is January numbers for BuzzFeed. Uh, 349 million people saw a link in Facebook, followed that link and went back to BuzzFeed to see a piece of content. But if they think, now what are the impressions that we have in the streams? That's 11.3 billion. So 11.3 billion impressions um, of a piece of content in someone else's stream. So they're thinking, well, why do we even need to bring people back? Why don't we just create our content in Facebook, the video, autoplay straight away. If it's small, short form content, just throw it in there. You don't need to even try and bring them back. So they're starting to think more and more about how their distribution content can work like that. So that's the collision of, of um, people, places, content, and experiences. Uh, and the third one is over to Sam. Second. Thank you. Second. Getting ahead of yourself. Yeah, so, um, so I'm going to talk about the second Collide to Thrive, which is, which is also very much in the kind of here and now for us. <clears throat> and that's the idea of actually going a little bit deeper and, and colliding some of the need states and desires that have evolved in what we call in the post-social era. What does that mean? All it means is that we have to address the level of maturity and intrinsicality 
um, to people's, people's lives that kind of social now has. And how, as a result, it's kind of rewiring, or perhaps more appropriately, kind of scrambling with, um, with our personal and collective psychologies. Th this was a theme of many talks, but um, Professor Christine Baucho from Le Moyne College in Syracuse in New York talked particularly brilliantly about this in, in her talk, Hashtag No Filters, The Pros and Cons of Constant Connection. And the thrust of it was that, you know, as well as trying to leverage the um, forming of around new behaviours and kind of social platforms, um, that we also need to think about and focus on how we're resolving some of the paradoxes and tensions that are born from the norming um, of behaviours around them. The effect that all of this is having um, on people's psychology. And the, and the often conflicting, actually, needs and desires that it's kind of uh, throwing up and that people are struggling to process and, and often to, to, to deal with. So we just picked out a kind of handful of examples that were explored during, during South by Two to bring that uh, to life and you know, perhaps help guide our thinking a bit. So the first one is, is the kind of need to connect functionally and the desire to feel connected emotionally. Um, in this context, emotionality, you know, it's a word we talk about a lot as marketeers. It isn't just something to think about in terms of your messaging, your tone of voice, you know, your UX maybe, if, if you're lucky. It's something to build into the heart of your digital role in people's lives. Um, so this is an app. Um, the, the image is an app uh, and wristband-enabled service called PeopleKeeper. No vows in the true tradition of uh, having funky names. So, uh, yeah, PPLKPPR, uh, and that helps you um, kind of better understand and make decisions around the emotional impact of your interactions with people in your social network um, and make decisions about how much time you spend online with them and what it is that you talk to them about and what it is that you avoid. Um, and it's really interesting that brands as well are starting to kind of experiment with this idea of kind of putting emotional scanning, um, intelligence, and feedback and dialogue into the heart of their customer experience, like Bank of New Zealand um, have been doing. Um, the second uh, collision is the collision of, uh, of the need to get to stuff seamlessly with the desire and the increasing premium, actually, on the joy of discovery and exploration and, the, and serendipity. Um, and many emergent players in, in kind of travel and food uh, and areas, lifestyle areas like that, are looking at this really hard and how they can help to resolve this tension. Like this is uh, this is Whimsy, um, the kind of travel site here. It's a sort of combination of um, kind of serendipitous discovery of destinations that you that you kind of wouldn't think about going to necessarily, with the ability to kind of you know get there and find out about it and and get the right deal all in the same package. Um, I think also uh, the collision between the sort of unquenchable thirst for entertainment that you know we've all been responding to um, in the previous section, and the, and and also the desire for authenticity. Morgan Spurlock was there, and um, he highlighted this in talking about Connected, um, which is his new participant shot digital docudrama that he's put together with AOL. It's actually in Israeli format that's that's kind of been exported all, all around the world. But in his words, um, it's things like this that look to finally deliver on the promise of reality TV to bring something more meaningful to, uh, to viewers' lives. Uh, it launched at the, uh, at the beginning of March, so it's, it's well worth checking out. And then finally, um, the need for curation and filtering in this sort of, you know, kind of inflationary um, universe of content and stuff. Um, but also the desire for greater access and being able to kind of you know, transact in the broadest sense of the world um, on the stuff that you are, you are getting exposed to and that you want to be a part of your digital uh, life. Rent the Runway um, CEO Jennifer Hyman was there um, kind of leading a debate around next generation retail. And um, she was talking about how they've grown a kind of five million strong uh, customer, customer base relatively overnight by combining kind of smart use of personal and collective data to help you kind of filter and curate, you know, fashion um, for yourself, but also marrying that with a new rental model of access to, to Haute Couture. Um, she joked about running the biggest dry cleaning company on the, on the 
planet in a, in a sort of a self-deprecating way. You know, that, that amazing kind of success by whacking those two things together. So that's um, number two, colliding to thrive in terms of need states and desires uh, in a post-social era of constant connection. And so next up, collision number three, uh, is one that we kind of found popping up all over Austin and all over South By in talk after talk, whether it was uh, the huge power of women in China's digital uh, economy, whether it was Princess Rima uh, talking about her sort of dual connections between the USA and Saudi Arabia, or whether it was uh, Aaron Lau's talk about the power of cultural collisions and the challenges that lie ahead for brands looking to thrive in China. Um, and. And we kind of think to build a, a cross-cultural future as a global brand, it's essential that you find a way to bridge these sort of cultural gaps, looking for opportunities to collide uh, and thrive. Um, and when you're crossing cultural boundaries, particularly when talking about kind of Eastern and Western markets, um, the prevailing thought seems to be that you've got to fit into one of two boxes. You're either a local brand that's kind of connected to the people and the place, and sort of of the people and the place, or you're a global brand, uh, bringing kind of enlightenment from the rest of the world to this sort of local market. Uh, and it's true that you can achieve a measure of success by picking one of these sides and, and operating like that. But uh, the future is really being built by people that cross these cultural boundaries uh, without being tied to, to either of them. And a great, a great example of this is uh, Jack Ma, uh, the founder of the, uh, the group, uh, the Alibaba group in China. Uh, and he knows that um, to thrive uh, when crossing cultural boundaries, you need to learn from both. Uh, Alibaba, for those of you who don't know, is a huge group uh, of innovative companies that made a lot of news recently when it launched uh, its first IPO on the New York Stock Exchange, raising $25 billion, which actually makes it the world's biggest ever IPO. Uh, and he's a very sort of Silicon Valley-style CEO, despite being uh, from China. Uh, he's been called the Chinese Steve Jobs. And he's built this incredible business that's thrived by disrupting the local market with Western ideas whilst also being unambiguously local. Uh, and a great example of this is what they've done with their sort of Alipay uh, payment service. So created in 2004, uh, Alipay is Alibaba's payment service, a bit like PayPal, uh, it, but it processed nearly $150 billion worth of transactions in 2013, which is compared to PayPal's $27 billion. Uh, Tellingly as well, Alipay was not part of the uh, IPO uh, on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and the challenges for Alipay and Alibaba Group in trying to disrupt an extremely traditional and slow-moving sector, i.e. financial services, uh, in China is really significant. Uh, and it's a challenge that uh, someone like Jack Ma and the Alibaba Group have approached with gusto. And um, so in 2013, Alibaba created Uibo, which I think I'm pronouncing right, but I'm not entirely sure. There's people here who can probably tell me. Um, which, in tandem with Alipay, has, has, had, a, has had a crack uh, at taking on the banking industry at their own game, particularly in the kind of saving and investment sector. So Uibo is a very simple investment product. Basically, when you use Alipay and you buy, for some, buy something online and there's a little bit of money left over, you can squirrel it away into your Uibo account, which becomes kind of your investment portfolio. Uh, and so every time you make a transaction, you can sort of save a little bit of money. And of course, by the big banks and the big investment and wealth management companies, they dismiss this as small time. You know, it's, uh, they said, um, Uobo is only for small investors. It's not in competition with the wealth man management products. We don't really need to worry about it. But as of Q1 uh, 2014, there are 500 billion yuan in, uh, in the Uobo investment fund, uh, which is about 55 billion pounds or 90 billion dollars. Uh, and that was accumulated in just over a year. Uh, to put that in some sort of context, in the US, there's only three uh, sort of money market funds that are bigger than that, the Vanguard Prime, Fidelity Cash Reserves, and JP Morgan Prime. Uh, and they've all been around for decades, uh, not just over 12 months. So that's looking at China. Another really interesting speaker uh, at South by was Princess Rima. Uh, she's the CEO of the Saudi luxury retailer, Alpha International. Uh, and she herself is kind of an incredible example of these cross-cultural collisions. She was born in uh, Saudi Arabia, moved to the States in 1983, and then moved back to Saudi in 2005. Um, and she talked a lot about the challenges that she's faced in her mission to empower Saudi women and be a successful uh, female businesswoman in, uh, in, in, um, 
in Saudi Arabia, uh, both in kind of the retail environments of our stores, but also in the wider community to make an impact. And, uh, you know, as I'm sure most of you know, women face some extreme challenges in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and they're so deeply ingrained into society that challenging them is not only kind of risky from a business and a personal perspective, but it's also often seen as unnecessary. Um, for instance, uh, for years, men have worked in the makeup and perfume counters in Harvey Nichols. Um, and to a Western mindset, uh, the problem's obvious, right? You know, men, men can't sell makeup, right? But the princess said it herself there. Yeah, they were actually very good at it. They were brilliant salesmen. They were doing a great job, and the women loved it. Um, but it was her kind of passion and determination to increase the presence of women in society um, that led her to, to make this transformation happen in department stores, get rid of these really good uh, male salesmen and replace them with women. Uh, that's made a huge difference to the customer experience, but also to the perception of women in society. Um, she's also been instrumental in raising the profile of Saudi fashion uh, with some amazing campaigns with bloggers like this. This was a fashion show on the edge of the world where she took a bunch of bloggers and models and, and fashion designers out to uh, a cliff on the outskirts of Riyadh and, um, and, and, and got them to blog about their experiences and take some incredible photos. Um, and finally, her sort of last act at South by Southwest was to launch 10KSA, which is a breast cancer awareness campaign uh, that takes kind of the marketing noose of a, of a US campaign and marries it with sort of the sensibilities of the Middle East in a way that's much more effective than creating kind of a generic global campaign and trying to transfer it over to the, to the Middle East. Um, but it's also doing something that if you were just rooted in the, in the, in the Middle East, you wouldn't even attempt. And so that's how, uh, that's how you, can, you can thrive and you can succeed by, by colliding different cultures together.